The machine knows, he says. The machine knows, and he follows it right into the lake. GPS, right? Everybody's got one. It's on your phone. It's in your car. It's, it's wherever it is. And let me just tell you how important the GPS is, right? Like everybody, if you have one or used one in the last like week and a half, let me see your hands. Yeah, everybody's hands. How, did we even, like, do people know how to read maps still? Is like that a thing? Because I don't know how. If you were to put a map in front of me, I'd be like, does it talk? <laughs> one thing I love about the GPS is it tells you exactly, right? Turn right. Turn left, stay straight, make a U-turn, the worst phrase ever, recalculating. <laughs> oh, man, and so much sin happens when uh, the phone is recalculating, let me just tell you. And so uh, I love the GPS. I think the GPS is important because it gives us direction. And so we're in this series called Summer Trips where we're talking about trying to get where we're going. And last week, PD came out and he talked about food and fuel, right? You need food and fuel to be able to go on a road trip and to get where you're going. And today we're going to talk about directions. And it'd be easy to say that everything that you need, all the directions that you could possibly ever need are right in this book. And I would venture to say that that's true. But even when it comes down to it, sometimes the GPS makes errors, does it not? Or if you misread it, then you end up turning into a lake. And so GPS is important, but it's not the end all be all. In fact, the Bible is an important book, but I would say in certain instances, it does not have the answer that we're looking for. Like, like if you're dealing with a mental health issue, you're not going to find how to deal with that issue in the book. There's nothing that talks about depression and calls it depression. There's nothing that talks about anxiety and calls it anxiety. There's nothing that talks about it. There's no GPS scripture specifically for what to do when a kid, your kid, your niece or nephew, your grandkid, your son or daughter ends up straying away from the faith and you don't know how to talk to them. There's not a GPS for how to deal with a specific amount of grief that you're dealing with because the Bible doesn't speak to your specific relationship with that person that you lost. So what do we do? All right, J-Mac, if you're saying that the Bible is the most important thing, if you're saying that this is the end-all, be-all, if you're saying that there is direction in this book, then what are we supposed to do? Like, uh, you're right, because you are saying that God is here and that he, he speaks through his word, and I truly and wholly believe that, but I, what do I do in this specific scenario? What do I do in this moment where I don't know what to do? If I just had the directions... If God were to just come down and stand in front of me and over a piece of pizza be able to discuss what was going on, that would be much better, right? Anybody here ever had pizza with God? Good, because if you raise your hand, we're going to have to talk about that mental health thing again. And so what do we do? What happens? Because I would venture to say not only the directions that you have, but also the path that you take are most important for how to get where you're going. That's the ultimate goal, right? We want to end up where we're supposed to go. And so we need directions and we need a route and we need, how, we need to be able to get there that way. And so today's big idea is this. God's directions don't necessarily lead on the path of least resistance, but they do his faithfulness to be true all along the way. Right? God's path may not be the one that is the easiest, most calm and smooth and best ride you've ever had in your life, but that is the one where you know that the creator of the universe, the one who is able to split the Red Sea, the one who knows all things, the one whose name is the name above every other name, that at his name every knee will bow and tongue confess that he is Lord. Like, that's the one that's going with us, and so maybe our path is not the one of least resistance, or maybe our path isn't the one where everything just goes exactly the way we want it, but it is the path where we know who goes with us. And so, I don't know what version of Christianity you were sold, but there is kind of this idea out there that, hey, once I start following Jesus, everything gets easier. Like once I start believing in Jesus, once I start, you know, really, really following him and committing to him and, and this whole thing, then life just gets easier. I don't know who sold that, but it is wrong and it's a lie. I didn't start following Jesus and everything was like, oh man, this is fun now. Like this is easy. 
In fact, if you were to model your life after Jesus, and Jesus says, hey, if you want to be a disciple of mine, you got to pick up your cross and follow me. Jesus didn't have an easy path either. Constantly harassed by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Put in front of people all the time. Confronting sin and sickness. Confronting demon possession. Confronting all of these things. In fact, the Pharisees and the Sadducees eventually tried to kill him multiple times and then ended up killing him. And so following God is not necessarily the path of least resistance. But Jesus also never wavers either. And so you can trust that beyond everything else, that the path that God has you on, the path that you are following, he's going to go with you. And so we go to this famous, famous text, and we can all read it together. Or you can just say it by heart because I'm sure you know it. Ready? Here we go. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. You know this passage. You've seen it on a t-shirt. It's on somebody's bumper sticker somewhere. Someone has a coffee mug with like that beautiful scenic, like, you know, bear in the woods, like climbing a tree and then trusting the Lord next to it. The problem with this passage is it's oftentimes misquoted and mistranslated. Because a lot of times people say, oh, here's all I need to do. I need to make my plan. I need to do what I want to do. I need to have it my way, and I'll form my own plan, and I'll make my own path, and then I'll just dedicate it to the Lord, and he's going to clear everything out, and it's going to be perfect and beautiful. That's not the, what this text means. And so we're just going to spend the next few minutes breaking it down kind of phrase by phrase and looking at what it actually means, this passage, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And so... Here's what we need in, in terms of background. First, we need to know who Proverbs was written by. The majority of scholars submit that the Proverbs were written by a guy named Solomon. Solomon is considered to be one of the wisest people in the history of all time. Had a prayer one time. Lord, I said, hey, I'm going to give you anything you want. And Solomon prays for wisdom, and then he becomes extremely wise. And so as kind of his manifesto, as his leaving legacy for his son, he writes down this book called Proverbs. And the whole purpose of Proverbs is for Solomon to be able to speak to his son about what it means to be wisdom and how we become wise. In fact, kind of the main verse in uh, Proverbs says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Right? You want to start to be wise. You want to have wisdom. You want to know how to navigate things. You want direction for every scenario that happens in life. You want to be able to be directed and loved and know where you're going. It starts with the fear of the Lord and not the fear of the Lord in I'm afraid of what God can do to me, but a fear of the Lord in I'm in awe of who he is and that he loves me. And so Solomon starts to write down these little statements for his son to read and understand. And he gets to this one and he says, hey, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways to submit to him and he will make your paths straight. And so the text starts off with this. Trust in the Lord with what? You guys did way better than first service. Well done. I have impacted this place. All right, great. So, um. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. This word trust is super, super interesting because it doesn't mean like I trust you with something. Like if PD tells me, hey, we're going to go out to lunch this week, I'm not going to bring my wallet because I'm going to trust that PD is saying I'm going to pay for your lunch. Why? You laugh. That's rude. PD, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's rude. They laughed at you. Uh, and so... It's not that kind of trust. This word trust literally means to lie face down in complete surrender. This isn't, I'm just trusting you to do something. This is literally, I have nothing left. I have nothing left to give. I know I can offer nothing. I know I can do nothing in this situation. I know I bring no wisdom. I bring nothing to it. And so instead, I'm going to lay here, spread out, and let you completely take over, Lord, because I have nothing and I am nothing. Solomon starts off and he says, hey, you want to know the direction? You want to know what wisdom is? You want to know what it means, how, how to follow God? It starts with you saying, hey, I'm going to get out of the way and I'm going to completely surrender all things. I'm going to lay down and say, Lord, take over. 
And so the, the idea is this. If you, if you want to find directions from the Lord, it starts with your surrender to Him. Like, if you want to know what the Lord is doing, you want the answers to those questions, you want to know what steps to take, you want to know how to handle situations, the first thing we have to do is surrender to the Lord and let Him take over completely. It means me saying, hey, God, I know that you are the creator of the universe. I know that you are the maker of all things. I know that you hold all things together in your hands. And so I'm going to step aside and I'm going to completely surrender to you. It's a trust. It's literally me giving up my right and saying, Lord, I want yours and yours alone. This isn't that fun either, right? Surrender is not a word that we like. We don't like it as humans. We don't like it as Americans. Like, we're not going, no, never surrender. You know, Goonies never say die. Like, that's our kind of mantra in life. And so this idea makes us uncomfortable because what it says is, hey, I'm going to go ahead and give up what I consider to be my right for something so much greater. I'm going to give up my own stake in the game and say that the stake that the Lord has is greater than mine and that he knows more and that I'm going to trust him no matter what. And so you want to start to find these directions. It starts with your full surrender to him. The text continues, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. Uh, this, past, this part uh, is super interesting because Solomon starts off and he says, hey, uh, you're going to trust the Lord. That means you have to completely surrender. And then he goes and he starts talking about our own individuality. He says, lean not on your own understanding. Now, I just want to parse this out for a second here because I think that this is important. This does not mean to not use your brain. Right, this isn't Solomon saying, just trust in the Lord, man. Just feel it. And just like whatever he says, you like, just go. It's going to be awesome. The Lord gave you a brain. He wants you to use it. And so what we have to do is we have to kind of look at situations and scenarios and figure out what the Lord is doing and what we're supposed to do in response. Right, here's what I mean. If the Lord were to tell you to kill somebody, what would you do? No one wants to answer that, right? I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to say I don't do it because then I'm going to be like dis I'm disobedient. I don't want to say I do it because then I'm a killer. Like, I get it, right? So here's what you have to do in that situation. You lean not on your own understanding, which means in that situation, though, I'm going to look at God's word. I'm going to look at the characteristics of who God is about what he says about himself. And what he says about himself is he's a deliverer. He's a protector. He's a provider. He's constantly delivering people from evil things. He constantly is raising people from the dead. I mean, you see that in Jesus. And then ultimately, he doesn't kill, but he gives up his own life. And so if you think that the Lord is calling you to do that, you've got to look at the rest of Scripture and say, man, I don't know that that's the God I serve because his word doesn't say that I should do this. You're not leaning on your own understanding in that scenario. You're using the brain God gave you, but you're also making sure that you're not going to be an idiot. Simple. The second part, though, is leaning not on your own understanding can be uh, difficult because sometimes the Lord calls us to do crazy things. But I don't know why you want me to pull over and take this homeless guy to lunch. Lord, I don't want to talk to her. I don't know her. I don't want to tell her my story. That makes me uncomfortable. I don't want to do that. God, no, I don't want to give money over here. Like, I don't think that that's good. I just don't want to do it. And so you, again, have to kind of lean not on your own understanding in terms of I'm not just going to make this decision on myself. I'm going to look to who God is and say, does this line up with what the Word says about the character and nature of God, and do I then be obedient? It's not you leaning on your own understanding at that point. It's you leaning on the understanding of what God has already said about himself. And so the second thing is this. If you want to surrender, or surrendering and finding directions means getting out of our own way. How many of you in here are overthinkers? This is a safe place, y'all. It's okay. Yeah, me too. I'm an overthinker, and so when I overthink things, when I tend to think that I don't make quick decisions, I become indecisive, and that's a problem. This week, I, uh, or, well, I took it a while ago, but I took it again this week. Does anybody know about the Enneagram? 
a few people, right? Enneagram is this cool uh, test that they have out now that kind of talks about personality traits and kind of labels it into one of nine kind of people. And you can take this test and figure out what you are. And it's super helpful because it, I mean, my friend Crystal says it best. She says, you ever take a test and you start reading things and you go, ouch, you know it's probably true. Yeah, I read my description and I was like, ooh, <laughs> I don't want to play this game anymore, right? Like, I don't want to know. But it's super helpful. And so the, the thing with it is this. When you take this test, you figure out your personality. And one of the reasons I wanted to do it was uh, we've been trying to get my wife to take it forever so that I can learn how to be a better husband. All right, here's the deal. I suck at being a husband. Anybody with me? They don't want to admit it. That means it's true, right? So... Um, I want to learn how to be better. I want to learn how to communicate better. I want to learn what makes my wife tick a little bit better because uh, I'm two years in and I still know nothing and I would like to learn a few things, right? And so I've been taking, or we, I took it, she took it, and I'm starting to kind of see these types of things. And I love the Enneagram. I think it's great. Here's the problem with the Enneagram I have. When I start to look at every situation, everything through the lens of this test, when I start to look at everything through what this piece of paper or this website says that I am, then I tend to lose faith because I say, Lord, you would never ask me to do that because I'm a six. God, you can't possibly be asking me to do something this crazy. And so when you become an overthinker, when you start to do these types of things, we as humans have a tendency to get in our own way and to get in God's way. And it's so much easier when we start to think about self, and we start to relate to self, and we start to dig into self to then say, well, I don't want to do this thing because it's going to bring me the least amount of joy that I can think of, so Lord, I'm not going to do it. Not knowing that the joy comes from the Lord. Right? That the obedience is what he's asking for, that he wants us to do things. He wants to use us. And so directions start with us surrendering everything, and then surrendering means getting out of our own way. It means that I'm not going to stand in here like a bump on a log and just make everything extremely difficult. It's the same as surrender in terms of, God, I'm going to let you be God and I'm going to be human and I'm going to follow and worship and adore you because you alone are worthy of my praise. And so we have to get out of our own way. We have to be willing to step out. We have to be willing to say, Lord, I'm going to move and you go. And so then he wraps up with this. And he will make your paths, what? A little bit louder for me. What? Straight. straight. That's right. He will make your path straight. Who makes your path straight? He does, right? Now, here's the interesting thing about this part of the text. It doesn't say he'll make your path easy. It doesn't say he'll make your path perfectly flat. It doesn't say he'll make your path without any trial or tribulation. It doesn't say he'll make your path perfectly just navigable and just wonderful and everything's great. It says what? Straight. You, you know where you're walking. And you're walking one foot in front of the other straight ahead. And so the directions come one step at a time. Here's what happens. See, we read that first text and we think, oh, God's either going to make whatever I say come true and he's just going to lead it and it's going to be great, or the opposite. We say, hey, Lord, you just show me the whole way and I'll be happy to be obedient once you show me the end game. And that's not how it works. The Lord doesn't show us the whole thing because he knows that if he shows us the whole thing, we are not going to be faithful with every step. So he says, instead, I'm going to light up one step at a time. Psalm 119 verse 105 says this, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. In this time, in the time of the Psalms, they did not have electricity. Don't know if you knew that or not. And so what they would have to do is pitch black outside they would carry a lamp or a torch. Now, here's the thing about a lamp or a torch. They're not extremely bright, and they can only show as far as you can reach. And so when he says, your word, Lord, your direction, your calling, your word is a lamp unto my feet, what he's saying is, you're going to light up my next step, and I just have to be faithful to take the next step. 
And God may not be answering the an- or may not be answering your question in the whole way that you want it to be answered right now. But what He's saying to you is, can you just take one step? And so, almost a year ago, Sarah and I started praying. Started praying about what the Lord might have for us. Started praying about what it would look like uh, to be kind of different. Started praying just about what I mean, what our life was. And so then January came, and I sat down in a meeting with uh, Pastor Andy and Pastor Dave, and they said, um, you know, how do you think ministry is going, this, that, and the other, we kind of walked through some things. And in that moment, because I'm comfortable here, and because this place is home, and I have a house, and I walk to work every day, I could have said, everything's great, I love it, let's do this. But instead I went with what had been stirring in me, And knowing that my only step was not to see what the end result was going to be, but go ahead and take that first step of faith, I said, man, guys, I I think the Lord's doing something. Like, I feel like I'm moving kind of into whatever role is next. Like, I feel like my time in student ministry is done. I feel like I'm kind of done in this area, and and I just, I don't know. Like, it's stirring, and it's, it's kind of messing with me. And so they said, all right, well, here's what we want you to do. I want you to go home, and for a week, pray and write down what your dream job description would be. Write it down. And then we'll see what we can do because we want you here. We love you. We think that you are an integral part of what we're doing here and we want you to be here. And so I did. I went home and started writing it down and then started praying more and truthfully felt, again, the path right here, just the next step is, hey, maybe not Advent. And so I came back and talked to them about that. And so it, the scary part in that situation is they literally could have looked at me and said, all right, you have two weeks to move out. Thanks for being here. But the Lord knows. The Lord knows who they are. The Lord has designed them specifically. And so literally since January, Pastor Dave and Pastor Andy and some of the people on staff have been praying for Sarah and I as we're kind of navigating this thing. Today is my last Sunday here. And so it's an interesting thing because guess what? I don't have a job yet, technically. This is the dumbest thing. Like, I'm dumb. Like, I'm an idiot. It's okay. You guys can be like, oh, my gosh. So pray for us, right? And so I don't have a job yet, but literally through this process, it's been one step at a time. And last week, we were up in Pennsylvania, and the roads were winding. We had the GPS and whatever, and we had the opportunity to meet people and see And so I'll tell you this, just as a kind of, so you can breathe a little easier. I don't have an official offer yet, but they basically said, as long as like I don't kill people and like have a really bad drug addiction or something like that, they'll probably give me an offer within the next like 10 days. All right, so that's exciting. So breathe easy. It's going to be okay. But this process has been crazy because it's literally been one step at a time and we're walking by faith going, Lord, I'm applying for jobs and no one's calling back sending out my resume, you're not qualified. And step by step, we've just been faith, 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 and we've seen the Lord continue to move and provide. So you want to talk about directions? You want to talk about GPS in your life? I don't have the answer. Like, I don't have what specifically, and now some of you want just me to tell you what you have to do to fix the problem in your life. I don't have that for you. What I have is I know who you need to go to. I know who walks with you. I know who has the power to overcome anything. The one who loves you so dearly that he gave up his own life for you. I know the one who literally has given you the power of the Holy Spirit. The one who Jesus looked at and said, hey, I'm going away, but I'm going to give you something that in you is going to do greater things than I have ever done. I'm going to leave that with you. I know that that's who you have. And so I don't have the answer to your problem, but I know who you need to turn to. I know who he is. And so I don't really have a point of application. This is all I have. Being obedient to God's directions may not have led you where you thought you were supposed to be, but it did lead you exactly where God knew you should be. And so full disclosure, Sarah and I came here about two years ago. And when uh, they hired me, I did not want to come. You're like, ooh, don't burn bridges on your last day, son. That's a bad idea, right? So let me just explain to you a little bit further. I was coming from a church that uh, had beaten me up a little bit. 
coming from a ministry situation that was uh, not great for me. I was tired. I was burnt out. I was stressed. We were about to get married. Was struggling with who I was in the Lord. Was struggling with what my role was in things. Was struggling in so many areas. I didn't know what it meant to be Lutheran. I didn't know. I didn't want to live in Boca. I mean, there were so many things, but all the jobs had kind of run out. And so PD called me and said, hey, would you come? And we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. And this is where the Lord had us. And so after two weeks, that was not changed at all because uh, within the first two weeks, we received a few comment cards about uh, me as a human being, uh, which were super fun. If you wrote them, you're forgiven, okay? No grudge. But the kind of the criticism came right away. And all I could think was, Lord, why would you bring me to a place where I'm just going to continue to get beaten up? But then soon after, and he revealed himself completely. Sarah and I have called this place home for two years. We have felt a tremendous amount of love. Like literally was here like a month before you guys did an amazing job and like, like gave us a bunch of money because we were getting married. Like just out of your generosity. You didn't know us. You guys have prayed for us as we've walked through some pretty trying times. You've walked alongside of us. I've had the opportunity myself here at Advent to be able to, to hone some skills. At my last church, I didn't have a say in anything. In fact, everything was told to me to do. Here, I've been able to sit in pastor's meetings and help come up with strategy. I've been able to help come up with sermon topics. On that note, like I never got to preach ever before, and you got, all of a sudden, Danny's like, hey, you want to preach? I was like, don't tell him that I don't know what I'm doing. Like, just... Just fake it, right? And so I could get up here. I mean, I've had the opportunity in my leadership and in my pastorship to be able to do things that I've never been able to do and to hone skills and all the while have felt a tremendous amount of love from the people here. I had to stand outside in the narthex literally like 15 or 20 minutes after church was done because I was still getting hugs from people. Like we have been bathed in love here. And so I didn't want to come here from the start, but the Lord knew that this was what I needed during this season. And so he knows what you need. He knows exactly what you need. Do you trust him in it? And as the band comes back out, here is what I want to do in closing. What I want to say, man, I am so thankful for you. You as a church, you as our friends. You as people who have stood alongside us in so many things. I also want to say that I, it is apparent that the Lord is here. Right? Like, it is apparent. You can't look around the room and see some of the things that we're doing in here on Sundays, in the Bible studies that we have, in the events that we're doing, in the reach to the community through the schools we have, and what's happening down in the gym right now with your kids being discipled. Like, you can't look at this place and say that the Lord isn't here. Like, He is absolutely here. And so I would say to you, do not be discouraged. Take heart, because the Lord is here, and I think the best is yet to come for Advent. And I'm really, really sad that we won't be here to see it, but I truly believe it. And so take heart in your leaders. Welcome the next guy in as you have loved me. I mean, be there for him. And so on behalf of Sarah and myself, I want to say thank you. It has been a joy. It's been a blessing to be here in many regards. And for me personally, it has been an honor to be called pastor by you. And so know that you are loved, you will be prayed for, and you will never leave us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your directions. God, that you... Lord, you know. You know what we need. You know when we need it. Lord, that we would be able to trust you and be obedient to what you have for us. And so, God, even when it seems grim, even when it seems dark, even when it seems like there's no hope, Lord, would you just light our next step? We love you. We love you. We love you. It is in Jesus' majestic name we pray. Amen.